Mr. Mandela, for three days we've been looking for a copy of your autobiography in, in uh, Johannesburg. It is out in all the bookstalls. Yesterday we found one bookstall which says we've got a fresh stock. We went there and they were out again. So I gather that on royalties alone you must be either a dollar millionaire or are you only a rand millionaire? No, no, no. I'm trying to compete with Amina here, you know, to be uh, a millionaire, you know. I'll take a long time to reach her position. <laughs> but the books are selling well. No, that's all right. I think people, you know, there is no um, good material in this country. Uh, they are concentrating on rubbish. You know? <laughs> so you started writing this. This project was conceived 17 years ago when you were 59 years of age. And it was to be completed when you would be 60. How did you manage to beat that very rigorous prison system and, and actually write your autobiography? One of the things uh, we discovered as prisoners was that uh, the water in your section is more important than uh, the commissioner of prisons who holds the rank of general and even more important than the minister of justice himself because uh, if you approach either the commissioner or the minister of justice and you say for example in winter I want an extra blanket he looks at the regulations and he says, well, we have given you the number of blankets authorized by the regulations. I can't do it. But if you go to a ward in a section and you say, I want an extra blanket, and you are friendly to him, he just goes to the storeroom and takes the blankets, and that's the end of the matter. Now, uh, I used the night uh, to write uh, the biography. Uh, and uh, warders, we had a, I had a very good relation with the warders, although they didn't know what I was doing, but I had a very good relation. I would then write a chapter and then uh, pass it on uh, to Comrade Walter Sassoulo, uh for correction as to facts. And having done so, I would pass it uh, to Comrade Cathredo, who has got a very sharp memory and uh, he would also go through it and then uh, with your corrections I would write now the final chapter. That's how we did so. And then uh, we got uh, Lalu Chiba who is very good at reducing uh, writing into a small print and uh, he and uh, Mac Maharaj who is now the Minister of Transport saw to the uh, technique of taking the biography out. How did you get it out? I gather that, that your, one of your comrades wrote bits in, on a matchbox or inside a matchbox. No, we wouldn't go into those details uh, uh, because uh, they are likely to be used by prisoners today who consider themselves political prisoners. And uh, to go into details, they say, might not be in the interest of political prisoners as you want to be in touch with uh, their movements outside prison. The point is that we found a method whereby we could take out this information without uh, detection by the prison authorities. So it, so it sounds like uh, one of those uh, 
uh, escape movies out of World War Two when all these surreptitious methods, you know, like Stalag 17 or something? Well, uh, these methods are similar, but uh, it's better perhaps not to go further to give uh, any indication as to the details of uh, the technique that was used in taking out uh, the manuscript. But we did take it out. And uh, the manuscript that has appeared, it went to London and then it got lost. Didn't something like that happen? No, it never got lost. You had buried uh, it somewhere in the... No, 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 no. no. What happened was that uh, we gave the original uh, to Mac Maharaj to take out. But uh, we took a precaution in case it's caught. We then uh, had a copy which we buried in the courtyard in prison, hoping that one day when we come out, we would go triumphantly to the courtyard and take it out. Now, as the um, government of the country, but that was not to be because it was discovered by the authorities. But uh, the original was out. So you said one day, triumphant, we'll come back and we'll sort of dig it out. Did you really imagine that you would be out and that South Africa would be free? Oh, no, we had never had any doubt that uh, one day we would return because uh, the movement inside was getting stronger and stronger and we had the support of uh, the international community. Uh, it did not matter what type of government was in power in a country. It might be a conservative or liberal government. Uh, it might be radically left uh, or highly conservative. All of them supported the struggle against supported. And uh, we were quite sure that uh, one day we would return. That does not mean that uh, we did not have moments when morale was very low and when uh, one doubted whether our optimism was justified. But those moments were few and far between. The dominating theme right through was that uh, we would come back. I gather there were differentiation. The apartheid system differentiated between the Indian prisoners and the African prisoners. I mean, how did this affect your lives in prison? I mean, Ahmed Kathrada was of Indian origin, and he possibly got superior porridge or whatever. No, there were uh, differences, which we knew, not surprising. But uh, we shared in spite of that. What were the differences, sir? Well, uh, you know, uh, Africans, uh, well, in the morning we got the same food, porridge, uh, with about half a teaspoon sugar, mm -hmm. a dish of porridge with about half a teaspoon sugar. And uh, all of us got that. But uh, lunch differed. We got a boiled millis. And uh, yes, Indians maize. got... This is maize. Maize. Yes, maize, yes. And Indians got a mealy rice. And uh, they got, uh, in the evening, we got uh, porridge as Africans. Indians and coloreds also got mealy rice. They got a piece of bread. And uh, they had uh, also a greater quantity of uh, meat. So those were the differences. But uh, when you had uh, good water in the kitchen, uh, they would cook uh, such a good food for us as Africans uh, that uh, colors and Indians would want to share our food. 
But again, that was, uh, uh, these were occasions which were not, uh, did not occur very often. They would prepare our vegetables, uh, fry them, you see, in fat, and so on. And, uh, and they were very attractive. Uh, but we as prisoners broke down those distinctions because uh, Indians who got bread shared it with us. And uh, so we virtually destroyed uh, the distinction, the differentiation, right from the beginning. In clothes, they gave you short pants? Yes, uh, generally speaking. They gave me, when I arrived, long pants. But uh, my colleagues were given short, short pants. Later, uh, they, uh, of course, uh, took away the long pants from me. And I was happy about that. Uh, and I identified myself uh, with uh, my colleagues. But we fought against that and eventually got long trousers and uh, destroyed uh, the distinction, the differences between uh, the various uh, ethnic groups of prisoners. Most of the leaders in India's national movement did a large bulk of their writing, their thinking, and their reading in jail. Did you use the jail for your, to catch up on reading as well? Well, uh, I read a lot of uh, the writings of uh, Pandit Nehru and a bit uh, of Mahatma Gandhi. And of course, uh, the history, the two volumes uh, containing the history of India. I read those before I went to prison. But uh, I read, I gave more attention uh, to the writings of Nehru in jail because I had more time to concentrate and to read uh, without interruption in two or three days and cover the book, which uh, made uh, the impressions uh, much more solid uh, and uh, indelible in one's mind. Did Nehru, would you consider Nehru as an influence in your life? Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, in the uh, liberation movement, we were looking for literature which uh, would uh, inform us on our own struggle, what principles to observe, and uh, the writings of Pandit Nehru in that regard were very useful, uh, even when making allowance for the fact that the conditions uh, between of I in India and South Africa were not identical. But broadly speaking, the tactics, the strategies um, were very valuable to us. Uh, the tactics and strategies devised in India were very valuable to us. Sir, in your life, have you had uh, sort of role models, people you idolized as thinkers, writers, statesmen? Could you, could you name one or two such people? Well, uh, one would like to keep that uh, private affair because uh, as a politician, you are also a public relations officer. And uh, one has got his own admirers inside. But uh, to keep them confidential and uh, to publicize them, these are two different things. All that I can say to you is that uh, my uh, role models are men and women uh, who would like uh, to raise the living standards of all human beings and uh, who would fight for human rights whenever, wherever in the world they are threatened or violated. But uh, to pinpoint individuals uh, to a public figure would be quite undiplomatic. <laughs> right, sir. What role have the Indians played in your national movement? Well, uh, you must understand uh, the evolution uh, of uh, uh, a freedom fighter uh, in any country. You start off uh, your horizons are limited at your villages, the hills are surrounding your villages. And then you go to college, you meet people from other parts of the country, and your horizons widen. Then uh, I came to Johannesburg, and I found a totally different situation. 
and amongst uh, my most intimate friends were people like Ismail Mir, like J.N. Singh, like Amina and uh, her husband, uh, Yusuf Kachelia, uh, Yusuf Dadu, and uh, these became uh, the most uh, powerful uh, friends uh, that I had. And uh, we spent uh, hours and hours exchanging views. And the idea, you know, was uh, to equip one to look at problems, not from a narrow angle, but uh, from a broad perspective. And uh, so, and then uh, uh, at that time, a man uh, like Dr. Dadu, uh, who was, uh, whose uh, level of literacy was very high, was impressive in the simplicity uh, of his life and the simplicity of his dress. There was a time when he wore only khaki uh, outfit and uh, boots, and uh, that impressed us tremendously. And therefore, the Indian leaders, like African leaders, like Moses Gordon, uh, J.B. Marx, uh, and uh, Walter Sisulu, played a tremendous role in uh, molding one's outlook. Cherish the ideal of a new South Africa where all South Africans are equal, where all South Africans work together in order to bring about security, peace, and democracy in our country. So one finds that there are almost a disproportionate number of people of Indian origin in your government and in the national executive disproportionate I mean to the population in this country and yet the paradox is that a majority of the Indian population actually voted for the other side how do you explain well what you terms? must understand uh, the fears of minority that is not unreasonable having regard to the conditions in our country uh, our minorities were bombarded with uh, racist propaganda by the National Party that uh, when Africans take over, you will be in a worse position than at any time in your history. And uh, uh, our own machinery, uh, as improved as it was, was not as effective as that of the National Party, because the National Party used racism unadulterated and uh, it was able to frighten the minorities, whereas uh, we preached uh, non-racialism. And, uh, and in that atmosphere of a society which has been divided from top to bottom by eth on ethnic uh, grounds, it was not easy for this message, for our message to go through. But uh, you'll have noticed recently that uh, in fact uh, I now have uh, majority support from the Indian community in terms of the latest poll. And uh, the majority support is not yet for the ANC, it's for an individual. Well, we are grateful for that, but uh, individuals come and go. Uh, and if that majority support is confined to the support of an individual, no matter how influential he may be in his organization, that uh, leaves much to be desired. We would like uh, the organization itself to be raised to that position where the Indian and other minorities uh, have confidence in the policy of the organization, not an individual. Uh, but uh, it's a position which we find even amongst Africans because the question many Africans asked what is going to happen when so and so goes? And where it pains in explaining that uh, a particular individual who heads an organization does not act on his own. You are actually carrying out a policy which uh, was established uh, decades ago 
especially in 1955, when uh, we published our basic policy document, the Freedom Charter. And, uh, but we have to explain that uh, time without number, that uh, don't concentrate on an individual, concentrate on an organization. Individuals, some individuals have been in prison for almost three decades. The organization has been built by people outside prison, inside and outside the country, who raised it to a standard of uh, influence which he had never reached before. And uh, that shows that uh, it is wrong to concentrate on a particular individual. It is the collective, a collective leadership that is responsible for the gains that were achieved, not an individual. An individual may have come uh, to join uh, that collective and made it stronger, but uh, to think that it was an individual who brought about victory is totally false, uh, is inaccurate and unfair to the masses of the people who sacrificed, both inside and outside the country. You've been talking about the racism of the Nationalist Party, and now they are your partners in the government of national unity. I mean, has this erased some of the misunderstandings that may have existed between the two of you? No, if you take into account the conditions in the country, our historical background, uh, one must be satisfied with the functioning of the government of national unity. Uh, the National Party is playing its role, and uh, some of the members of the National Party are excellent uh, in their speeches inside and outside Parliament. They are committed to, to the idea of national unity. And uh, I think, having regard to our background, we are doing well. And the Afrikaners as a community are responding very well. Uh, if uh, you take into account the fact that uh, many uh, municipalities dominated by Afrikaners are now making statutes uh, honoring the president, the black president, you will see the fundamental change that has taken place and that continues to take place in the country. And of course, this is a process which cannot be achieved overnight. But uh, I am satisfied that all population groups in this country, African, colored, Indian, and whites, are contributing very handsomely in building the new South Africa. So you're going to India to be the chief guest on our Republic Day, the 26th of January. But you're also going to sign several agreements. Could you spell out some of these agreements? Well, I'm highly excited about my visit to India. I was there in October 1990, and uh, uh, I'm very keen to go again, uh, because uh, India has been one of the countries which has been foremost in supporting us. You will remember that apart uh, from the link uh, which was established uh, by uh, the arrival of Mahatma Gandhi in this country. That has uh, established a very deep and strong bonds between the two countries. And I'm very happy, therefore, in going there. We are going to sign a wide range of agreements, economic, political, and diplomatic, and uh, to ensure that uh, this relationship is now translated into concrete properties.
other day, in fact, we saw a small brick being laid for the reconstruction of a new South Africa. We went to a school. This school was all white once upon a time. And now we find that because of a statement made by you, a black woman who used to be a maid in one of the neighboring houses, it's an all white suburb, she came to the school with her child and she wanted her to be, him to be admitted. And lo and behold, the child was taken in. We went to the school and we found black and white children playing in perfect harmony. And to me, it looked like really the beginning of a new South Africa. Have you heard about this particular incident I'm talking about? No, uh, there are many incidents of this nature. You must understand that uh, this is a process where you are trying to change the mindset of a community, especially at a, a community which has been racially divided for more than three centuries. You must expect these things. The important thing is that uh, all communities are responding excellently uh, to the new dispensation. And uh, that is what is heartening and uh, giving us hope uh, for the future.